Well, good evening and thank you for joining me tonight. So I like to do bits and bobs that are a bit different sometimes and I'm going to do something a bit different tonight. Um, I'm going to read something by Elliot O'Donnell who, uh, for those of you who don't know, Elliot O'Donnell was uh, pretty much the first celebrity ghost hunter. Back in the 1920s and 1930s he had a radio show um, and sold lots of accounts of hauntings and stuff to magazines. Um, so, with that said, he had to provide a certain amount of excitement in his articles and pieces. So maybe on occasions it was slightly embellished, but it made for good haunting stories. And also, I think it's... When I was a kid, I read about Borley Rectory and... It scared the heck out of me. And ever since then, I've found rectories quite scary. <laughs> For no logical reason. So, this is one I really like. It doesn't have a title because it was found in Elliot O'Donnell's papers after he died. Um, it wasn't one he managed to get published. But it's very interesting nonetheless. This case is of the old rectory at Rattlesden, a village in Suffolk. The case is of special interest not only for its chilling aspects, but also for the example it gives of the truth lying behind a village superstition. It also shows how the more determined and patient ghost hunter can ultimately get at the underlying truth, and few were more determined than the late Robert Thurston Hopkins. Mr Hopkins, like myself, did not settle for inconclusive evidence and hearsay, but was always ready to jump on his bicycle and investigate. And so, he unearthed the full story of Rattleston. His first intimation of the haunting came by pure chance one winter's evening of 1908. He'd arrived at Ipswich and put up for the night at an inn. There he had supper with another resident for the night, a cyclist passing through on his travels. And after their meal they were joined by the landlord, a tall, powerful man who carried his seventy years very lightly. The conversation took an antiquarian turn and the landlord spoke of a rambling red brick rectory that stood on an ancient mound overlooking a dried up quayside at Rattleston, which he said Hopkins really ought to see. As a rectory, it was about 500 years old. Then taking his listeners into a sudden confidence, the landlord told them how he'd once stood face to face with a ghost. He emphasised that they could think what they liked of his story, but he would tell them truly and conscientiously what occurred. When he was about 20, said the landlord, he worked for a carpenter at Stowmarket. He was handy with tools and so was often in request to repair hot water tanks, wells, pumps and so on at country houses. One afternoon he was told to go over to Rattleston and repair some panelling which had rotted away in the old rectory. I was delayed in starting by a deluge of rain, so when I did make a start it was almost twilight. I was working on some oak panelling near the pantry. Within the house there were small, many ancient chambers, a regular rabbit warren of a place it was. There was some of the original panelling and many zigzagging passages. According to local gossip, one of these passages near the pantry was called the Ghost Walk, because a ghost was often heard at night walking along it. As I worked away at the panelling, I noticed a sour, musty smell, which made me feel depressed. Rats suggested themselves to me as an explanation for I was told that old woodwork was full of rats. But all the same, I felt there was something wrong with the house. 
It seemed hostile, aloof, and secretive. I had a silly impression of being watched, so that I kept looking over the pantry door in case there might be someone peeping out of it and keeping an eye on me. The door was partly open, and I'd thrown over it a large dust sheet, which I always carried in my bag in order to cover any article of furniture or carpet while I was working. Suddenly, I heard a rustling and shaking inside the pantry. Surely, I thought, more than a rat could cause. It happened many years back now, but you gentlemen will hardly realise how uncanny it was for me to see two hands suddenly come over the top of the door and pull my dust sheet into the pantry. Somehow the idea of walking over to that door and pulling it open seemed, oh, intolerable to me. I couldn't bear the idea that these two hands might suddenly clutch me. A moment later there was a whistle, low and eerie. The door opened wide and I got a horrible shock as there came out my white dust sheet with a head lolling on top of it. For some seconds, it remained silent and motionless, just outside the pantry door. Then it whistled again, the same low whistle. Believe me, I was a perfectly sane lad, not given to fancies, and I was as strong as an ox. I was almost instantly seized with the idea that the vicar's coachman was playing a trick on me to give me a scare. So I picked up my heavy hammer and bounded towards the figure yelling, stop fooling and come out of that sheet. But with a sudden smooth motion, the thing rushed past me and took up a position in the corner near the well staircase. As it made this rush, It dropped the sheet. And I was horrified to see that it was naked. A thing with pale, blotchy skin. The colour of old parchment. For a few seconds, I watched this apparition in a state of benumbed perplexity. And as I was watching it, my brain seemed to go muzzy. I felt that some force was passing from the thing in the corner to me. It seemed to be some foul influence which was thrusting itself on my brain and sapping all the powers of my mind and body. I felt that my conscious was gradually being smothered by a thick black mist. As I stood there, half dazed, the thing began to move again, in a kind of crouching posture. I have said it was naked and shaped like a man, but I couldn't see its face distinctly, only a kind of phosphorescent glow. I remember wondering if the thing had eyes. I couldn't see them. Anyway, it appeared to be blind, for it came towards me with arms outstretched, just as a man would advance if he was feeling his way in the darkness. I had a sickening, overwhelming feeling of evil and was conscious again of that sour, musty smell. Up to that time, I'd laughed at ghost stories. But when I saw that thing coming towards me with nodding head and arms held out gropingly, I was certain it wasn't human, and I'll admit to you that the terror which I endured at that moment almost caused me to lose my mind. I can tell you, gentlemen, that for many a year afterwards, I was what you might call a haunted man. Yeah, even ten years after the very memory of that encounter was enough to put me off balance for days. 
as I saw the thing groping its way towards me. I remember trying to throw off the feeling of paralysis which seized me, and I suppose I must have roused myself out of it, for with an effort of power I found myself wrestling with the ghost. I was again conscious of that horrible smell. I felt a cold, sightless face pressed close to mine. I think that was the final shock. For the place spun round and I believe I fainted. When he came to, said the landlord, the thing had vanished, but that horrible fusty smell of churchyard mould was terrible. Then, seeing the look of inquiry on the faces of his two listeners, the landlord became a little nettled. If ever a man saw a ghost in the world, he said defiantly, I did that day. And that's as sure as the stars look down on us and the sun shines down on us. It all happened years ago, but all the old people of Rattledon know of it. Some of them saw it just as I did. I asked if he could describe the face of the apparition, no matter how vaguely the landlord said it couldn't be called a face at all. But it was apparently intensely horrible to look at. It looked like a wizened pig's bladder and a dried up blue tongue dangling from its mouth. It was rather dark in that hall and I couldn't see very clearly and I was about half conscious at the time. So was the old rectory still standing? He didn't know. He hadn't been over that way for years. Why did he think the ghost haunted the place? He did not think, said the landlord. He was absolutely certain. The ghost haunted the rectory because his body had been buried under one of the corridors. Most people in Rattlesden know that one vicar who died in that old rectory never came out in a coffin. It may have been a hundred years ago that it all happened, but the story goes that something very devilish was on foot in the rectory in those days. I could tell you a lot more about Rattlesden Old Rectory but I should only be echoing village gossip. How, when the servants tried to open the pantry door, there was often a quick and powerful pressure on the other side, and it sometimes shut with a crash. How no dog would ever stay in the house. How one of the vicars had the pantry door nailed up, after which the most extraordinary sounds came from the other side of it, bumping and thumping accompanied by the crash and rattling of iron pots and pans. I can't tell you if these tales are true, or just village tittle-tattle, but my account of the affair is perfectly true. And that's how it was left on that night in 1908, not for more than 30 years was Mr Hopkins able to follow up the landlord's strange story. Then, in November 1941, finding himself in the vicinity of Rattleston, he called at the rectory. It was something of an anticlimax, for no rambling old ghostly building met his gaze, but one comparatively new. From the vicar he learned that the old rectory had been pulled down in 1892 and not a vestige of it remained. However, the vicar was able to produce some very valuable evidence in the form of a collection of holograph notes and photographs made by a past vicar, the Reverend Olorenshaw. And here... Hopkins found the solution to the haunting. Among the faded photographs was one, a view of the hall near the haunted pantry, which pictured age-blotched floors and a sooty low ceiling, damp-stained and time-blotched walls, and a dreary well staircase 
with ancient dumpy balusters. A very gloomy, suggestive scene. No wonder a former vicar who had lived in the place described it as a rat-infested nest of dark rooms and twisting corridors entirely given over to the powers of darkness. There were many well-vouched-for facts about the ghost in the pantry. The Reverend Mr. Olerenshaw, while he didn't enter any discussion about those in his notes, made a meticulous record of the fact that village people and his own servants found that there was some presence in the old rectory that made solitude at times impossible. The haunted pantry, he said, with ancient red bricks, and exactly in the centre of it was a depression in the bricks of a darker colour. And that depression was shaped like a coffin. In 1892, when the old rectory was demolished, Mr. Olerenshaw made sure to be present when the floor of the pantry was removed. In the course of the digging, the workmen found a skeleton and some rotten wooden planks. On examination, the skeleton was found to be that of Robert Bumpstead, who died in 1780. Inquiries brought to light that the unhappy man had died in debt, and the creditors were waiting to seize his body. It was not clear whether he was a vicar or a church warden, but evidently he was in some way connected with the rectory and his friends thought that once he was buried in the pantry, his remains would be safe from body snatchers. Mr. Olerenshaw had the bones carefully collected and buried in the churchyard, near the grave of several church wardens. But even that was not the end of it. Apparently, Robert Bumpstead walked the churchyard after he was buried, until at length the archdeacon had to be called in, and clergy assembled, in order that his still troubled spirit might be laid to rest. And after this service, the place seemed to find peace at last. So there we go, a bit more of a Ghosts and Chains clanky traditional haunting. And as much as I love pulpy trash horror books, I do love a clanky chain traditional ghost. Definitely. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. You guys stay safe. And if there's ever any rattling coming from inside the pantry door... Just take a few steps back and leave it be. Stay safe, guys. <laughs>